quite a bit here from Colossians, and you can read that yourselves, but you know, he is, he is talking about the mystery of Christ. There is one phrase there that, uh, in the light of what we saw with the Galatians, is kind of important to us, because what he says there, it's uh, verse 11, towards the, oh, about the fifth line down from the second paragraph. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism. You were also raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. I'm sorry, page 12, first column. Right about the middle. Yeah. So what he's doing there is comparing the the cross in this, in Christ's death, putting to death his flesh, comparing that to a kind of a spiritual circumcision. Uh, that the that that in a sense the flesh is symbolically done away with in circumcision as, as a sign of the covenant but now in Christ the flesh is put to death in order to rise in the spirit and in baptism we, our flesh, is put to death in order to rise with the spirit now he means something by flesh beyond just our bodiliness. He means our natural bodiliness. Um, the life of the resurrection is very, very bodily. As, as you know, we, we see in um, Paul talking in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, where he's in Athens, and he starts talking about the resurrection, and they say, ah, you know, we don't want to hear all of that stuff. Because in Greek philosophy, the, the perfection of the spiritual was to be removed from the body, not to be part of it. And then 1 Corinthians, of course, has a, has a lot there. And because 1 Corinthians talks so much about the unity of, of the body... Of the unity of Christians as members of the body of Christ. But behind that is always um, the crucified body. And that we identify with this crucified body of Christ. Therefore, we identify with the sufferings of one another, the needs of one another. We can't separate our union with Christ from our union with one another, particularly where he is... Um, uh, where he is suffering. And what's interesting in 1 Corinthians there, and this is on the third column of page 12, a little below halfway, uh, he makes it pretty clear that this isn't just his doctrine. That it is what he has received. And what he has received from the apostles. From Cephas, Peter, from the twelve, and that after Christ died, he rose and appeared to them, and last of all, he appeared to Paul. And then Paul had to go back and fill in. So, you know, some people say, well, it was Paul who was the inventor of Christianity. Well, he certainly he certainly, was, he certainly gave Christianity a, a certain strong emphasis and strong flavor. But the heart of that faith in Jesus Christ, he makes it very clear that he is not bringing that, that that is what he has received himself from the Lord and from the apostles. So, in those words in in 1 Corinthians, he's really affirming the existence of that tradition 
that eventually was going to be written down in the Gospels. What he is saying is those stories that you're going to be reading 20 years after my death in the Gospels, um, I was already instructed in them. Those stories from the apostles that you have been hearing, I received from, from the apostles. So, he is affirming a real continuity there prior to the time when the Gospels were written down. Uh, most scholars are in pretty much agreement that none of the four Gospels was actually written in the form that we have it now by an eyewitness. None of them were eyewitnesses. Uh, they, they, were, they were all compiling and writing uh, oral traditions and bits and pieces of written traditions that, that they themselves had received. Okay, for the rest of Paul, uh, not surprisingly, Romans, he develops this quite a bit. I only quoted a little bit of it there. But so much of it is connecting the death of Jesus to our faith, to the uh, to the baptism of Christians. That as Jesus died and then was raised from the dead, we die with him and are raised. Um, the letter to the Hebrews, I'll just talk about for just, just a little bit here. Uh, In the letter to the Hebrews, and we know very little about the origins of Hebrews, it's definitely not St. Paul. It's a very different style from St. Paul. It's a very different sort of uh, letter. He has different themes. He treats them differently. But when he is talking about the cross of Jesus Christ, really, he, the author to the, of the letter to the Hebrews um, is the one that talks about the death of Christ in terms of sacrifice. Because for him, writing to Christians of a Jewish origins, or possibly writing to Jews trying to um, um, you know, convince them of the fulfillment that's found in, in Jesus Christ, he compares Jesus to a high priest. That's the only place, really, in the entire New Testament where Jesus' priesthood is, um, is unfolded. His priesthood is unfolded in terms of the Old Testament priesthood. And uh, what he is saying is that he was both priest and victim. And therefore, the cross of Jesus Christ not the blood of goats and bulls and, and sheep and whatever, but now the, uh, uh, the blood of Christ itself has, is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament sacrifices. So that's, an, that's a different twist, one that has become kind of central to our faith. We, we talk a lot about the sacrifice of Christ and the holy sacrifice of the Mass, but all of that really stems mostly from the letter to the Hebrews. Um, very, very little in, in, in Paul itself really um, emphasizes that. It's not to say it's completely absent, but Paul is much more talking about the union of Christians with the crucified and risen Christ.